The first from Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what future it sees for Scotland's fishing sector. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, currently, the overall mood in Scotland's fishing sector is positive, as demonstrated, presiding officer, by the new vessels on order and the value of landings during 2017 being at record highs. This is in no small part due to the efforts made by the Scottish industry to improve sustainable fishing practices, including moves to a more highly selective gears. This has contributed to a situation where the state of fish stocks shows a healthy picture. The number of stocks set in line with maximum sustainable yield continues to increase. Uh, of the 13 stocks the Scottish Government measures, its sustainability performance against uh, nine stocks have been set in line with MSY. Donald Cameron. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. And in light of his answer, does he agree with Ruth Davidson that Brexit will allow us to create a better fisheries policy by, and I quote, designing a world-class management system that delivers the maximum possible sustainable yield for UK fishermen, while also protecting the marine environment and encouraging species growth? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I certainly do not agree with, uh, with Ruth Davidson. Uh, and I don't agree for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I've repeatedly asked uh, Mr. Gove and Mr. Eustace uh, to confirm that they will not seek to trade away, yeah. post-Brexit, access to Scotland's waters. Answer, there has come none. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I have asked uh, the UK government also to confirm what their plans are to allow EU nationals to continue to do the good work, the essential work that they do both on and offshore uh, presiding officer in the fishing sector. Answer, there has come none. And thirdly, I've also asked the UK government to confirm what plans they have, if any, to replace uh, the £95 million that has been enjoyed in Scotland since 2014 under the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which has been so essential, so essential for the fishing sector. And answer, there has come none. So maybe... Mr. Cameron could use what influence he has, if any, with the UK government to try to get a few answers. Uh, and then, of course, Scotland will be in a better position to judge whether Ms. Davidson is talking nonsense uh, or not. Tavish Scott. Well, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, instead of uh, agreeing with Ruth Davidson, could I encourage the Cabinet Secretary to agree with the Shetland Fishermen's Association, who submitted a policy catching proposal to his uh, office? And when he gets the chance to visit Shetland, maybe he would meet with them to discuss that, particularly the proposals in relation to discarding and reducing discarding, involving fishermen and scientists working together. There's some innovative ideas in there. Would he undertake to look into that and to see if that such an approach could be introduced as soon as possible? Fergus, you. That does sound like a preferable option. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as the member knows, I do hope to visit his uh, constituency in the relatively near future. And I have undertaken to meet with uh, representatives of Shetland Fishing. And of course, that's a diverse group of people, as he well knows. So I'll meet uh, uh, a, a various uh, fishing interests when I'm there. I'm also able to say that just uh, recently, I did meet the uh, a representative uh, from the regional inshore advisory group rep representing uh, Shetland and was extremely impressed by the profound and practical grasp that she had in relation to all of these matters. So yes, we will most certainly take account of the experts in his constituency that really know what they're talking about. Question number two, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the importance to the rural economy of an EU migrant workforce. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, it is crucial, Presiding Officer. The interim report of the National Council of Rural Advisors recommends a tailored approach to migration that supports entrepreneurship and innovation in Scotland's rural economy. We also uh, have clear evidence submitted to the Migration Advisory Committee and in Scotland's place in Europe that the crucial role of migrants in rural Scotland is one of the key reasons why a one-size-fits-all approach to immigration is not appropriate for Scotland's needs. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It's clear he is as concerned and dismayed as I am at the reports that farmers here in Scotland are having to leave quality produce to rot in fields because they do not have enough workers to harvest everything. NFU Scotland note this year before the UK has even left the EU 
that there has been a shortage of between, between 10 and 20 per cent of seasonal workers coming from the EU. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could set out why this is such an important matter for not only our rural economy and communities, but Scotland as a whole. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, Mr Dornan is absolutely correct. And to answer his question, our rural economy depends significantly on the 10,000 people from the EU countries who are estimated to work in the food and drink sector and up to 22,000 seasonal migrant workers employed in the soft fruit and vegetable sectors. And it is no hyperbole to state that food is starting to rot in fields. It's simply a fact that increasingly we are getting from all sectors in the farming uh, industry, particularly where migrant workers are important, seasonal workers reports that uh, they are concerned that there will simply be not enough people who used to come and who are welcome to come to Scotland to give of their labor and their effort. Uh, and most recently, I visited Glenrath Farm, an extremely successful farm, and spoke to some Polish workers. And what they told me was really, really interesting, that they themselves have been in Scotland and plan to stay here, but the sense that their family members will not be welcome to join them here is souring their view towards a country that welcomed them with open arms. So it's not just the people that are here, it's the feeling that they and theirs, their kin, their families who may need to come and live with them for various reasons, presenting officer, are not welcome under the Brexiteer's view of uh, Britain that is extremely and profoundly alarming. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the great majority of workers in the fish processing sector in the northeast of Scotland are from uh, citizens of other European countries, and the great majority of them would like to continue uh, to work here. Can I ask if he is uh, if he has engaged with the trade unions representing those workers to hear about their concerns, whether he's engaged with the employers about their future plans for the sector, uh, and, and if not, uh, if he will undertake to do so. Cameron Singh. Well, I, I can certainly confirm that I've engaged extensively with the uh, fishing sector, both on and offshore and in the processing sector. Uh, it's important in Mr. Mac McDonald's uh, regional constituency, I know, and I am due to uh, visit the Northeast very shortly as well and meet uh, with various stakeholders. And he is absolutely right to, to say that, th that uh, the uh, people who come from other EU countries and who work extremely hard uh, in fish processing operations, for example, but also as crew uh, on fishing vessels offshore as well, uh, in various types of boats and large, medium and small, they're all absolutely crucial to the operation of the fishing sector and so many other rural sectors that without them, one really wonders whether businesses will be able to operate as they do, if at all. So this is an extremely serious issue. We've been making our view clear that Scotland welcomes people from these countries with open arms, and we've extended that, the First Minister has, for, uh, for the, since the day of the European referendum. And we're now uh, a matter of a very short number of weeks before the proposed Brexit day, and we're absolutely no further forward. There's no clarity whatsoever from that party's lot. Complete silence about this issue, actually, which is somewhat demeaning from their point of view. It's about time the UK government brought forward some proper plans in this matter. Question number three, Graeme Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that the rural economy is not adversely impacted on by large-scale developments. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government supports sustainable growth and investment in our rural areas. Planning policy is in place to manage the impacts of development on the rural economy, environment and communities. Graeme Simpson. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Research carried out by Mountaineering in Scotland has indicated that there is a drop in jobs related to tourism, an important part of the rural economy, when turbines are built in our most scenic places. The reverse appears to be true in other areas, though. So would the Cabinet Secretary agree with Mountaineering Scotland that more detailed studies are needed to help guide planners when considering new wind farm projects? And will he endeavour to speak to his colleague, Kevin Stewart, about this? Cabinet yeah, Secretary. Um, well, I would have thought the member would know that uh, you know, I am no longer responsible either for energy policy or for tourism policy. I used to be. Maybe that's why he asked me the supplementary question. Uh, but, uh, but I can absolutely assure him uh, that uh, tourism has been hugely successful in Scotland uh, and that all the evidence that I'm aware of suggests that uh, 
It uh, is because of the scenery that many people come to Scotland and they continue to enjoy it, and their enjoyment is by no means a, 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 a hampered by wind developments. Indeed, I well remember, actually, the visit of some Danish students. Uh, this is not my portfolio, but I may as well answer the question. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, some Danish students uh, that I met when I was celebrating uh, the Diageo's uh, successful Glen, Glen Kinchy Distillery Visitor Centre told me we came to Scotland specifically in order to see the wind farms. Yes, yes they did. So there we are, there's some real life information for the member. I suggest he spends less time here and goes out and finds, just finds some facts of his own. Question number four, Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to the forestry sector. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, me again, very often. Uh, the Scottish Government provides significant support to a sector which is worth nearly £1,000 million a year to the Scottish economy and supports 25,000 full-time equivalent jobs. In the current financial year, this support has included over £40 million for forestry grants, including £34 million for new woodland creation 7.85 million pounds to the Strategic Timber Transport Fund and nearly 1 million pounds for Scottish specific research into timber development and tree health. In addition, our national forest estates uh, generate over 1 million pounds per day gross value added to the Scottish economy. Alison Harris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and I'm very pleased to hear everything that the Scottish Government is actually doing. However, I'm concerned that the planting of new trees has fallen since 2013. What discussions have the Scottish Government had with the Forestry Commission regarding this decline in new planting? Cabinet Secretary. No, the planting is not falling, it is uh, rising. Uh, the, the statistics which I'm happy to share with the member if she wishes to seek out the information from me will demonstrate very clearly that planting is rising very substantially indeed. So I really am completely bemused as to where she's getting her figures from. She hasn't consulted me about this so far as I know. She's welcome to do so if she has an interest in this topic and I'm very happy should she do so uh, to provide her with some actual facts. Graham Day. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could uh, set out how the track record of this Scottish Government on tree planting compares to that of the Tories in England and Labour in Wales. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, the facts are um, that since 2016, Scotland has created 9,400 hectares of new woodland compared with 1,900 in England and 500 in Wales. So Scotland has actually accounted for almost 80% of new woodland creation in Great Britain during this period, with much more currently being planted or approved to be planted over the coming years. And I'm also able to say that you know, our ambition is to plant 10,000 hectares a year, and I expect we will achieve that pretty soon. Uh, the UK's ambition is to achieve the plantation of 11 million trees by the end of this decade. That translates to 4,500 hectares. Um, the only word that I can come up with that ap accurately describes the limitations of England's ambition in this respect, presiding officer, is not particularly parliamentary, but accurate. It's piddling. Colin Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the, of the deep concerns of, of tenant farmers on the Buclew Estate and Estale that some of the incentives for planting are actually leading to the potential loss of their tenancies due to, to those plans for extra planting. What does the Scottish Government intend to do to protect the interests of those tenant farmers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, the uh, funding available for assistance towards the cost of forestry does, is a contribution to cost. It's not the total cost. Uh, I think it's recognised across the Chamber that this is a sensible way of encouraging forestry, which is a long-term business, because there's no substantial income in most cases for a minimum of 40 years other than income from thinnings. Uh, even for the species which reach maturation uh, most rapidly. Uh, in relation to the matter he raises, uh, the Scottish Government believes that uh, an integrated approach to policy management in rural Scotland has a place for both uh, uh, farming and forestry. And indeed, we go to considerable lengths in order uh, to encourage and see the growth of uh, forestry development within farms. There are a number of projects I'd be happy to share 
with the, with the uh, member, Mr. Smith, about that if he is interested therein. So I think both can be accommodated in Scotland. I cannot comment on the particular details of negotiations between individual parties in an, in an estate. That would not be proper for me to do so. But I'd be very happy to meet with the member if he has specific concerns that he would wish to discuss with me. Question five, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government to what extent any transition period for Brexit is likely to affect Scotland's influence on future fisheries negotiations? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has consistently made clear its support for a transition period to avoid damaging uncertainty, uh, both for individuals and businesses after Brexit. And while the EU has been clear that a steady state transition could be agreed, the UK Government's selective definition of the parameters of such a transition has resulted in a vague and incoherent approach. So we continue to make clear that where Scottish uh, interests such as fisheries are at stake, the UK Government must ensure that pragmatic arrangements are made which allow Scotland to continue to participate in specific EU decisions, such as annual fishing quotas during this period. Richard Lockett. People may feel that one of the few silver linings of Brexit is departing from the common fisheries policy and of course the Leave campaign and the Conservatives promised that Scottish waters would be returned to Scottish control in March 2019. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree that if the transition period is agreed in such a way that decisions over the fate of Scotland's fishing communities continue to be take, taken in the EU when the UK is not officially a member of the EU, then not only would that be a breach of faith to Scotland's fishing communities from the Conservative UK government, but also the worst of all worlds, because we would not be there to influence the decisions that affect the fate of our fishing communities for the duration of that transition period. Does he therefore agree with the Scottish White Fishers Producers Association and the Shetlands Fishermen's Association that such a position would be extremely damaging and completely unacceptable? Yes, I do agree with those bodies. And yes, this is a very distinct risk. And our long-standing position has been that the common fisheries policy is cumbersome, it's unduly burdensome on the Scottish fishing industry, uh, largely because we have very limited scope to influence or shape that policy. But to be in a situation, presiding officer, where we have even less influence over such a key policy and have no one, no one at the negotiating table in December uh, during the fishes talk, fishers talks, which. Uh, the member uh, knows more about than I think anyone in this chamber and he will know just how important it is to be there at the table in the discussions involving in deals sorting things out getting the best deal for Scottish fishermen if there's nobody actually there how in goodness sake can we expect anything other than uh, a, a very dis disappointing and possibly even an extremely bad outcome to those negotiations and that really does show the utter incoherence of the UK government's position on this matter, if indeed they have a position, as I perhaps may be giving them too much credit. Thank you. We'll turn now to environment, climate change and land reform questions. Question number one, Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the potential environmental impact of developing on the green belt around Aberdeen. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. It is for the relevant planning authority to consider the impact of any proposals for development on the green belt around Aberdeen. Mike Rumbles. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the public concerns with the proposed Kingsford Stadium causing issues with environmental impact on the green belt and of course traffic congestion. Since Aberdeenshire Council objected to this development and the city approved it, can the Cabinet Secretary explain who two sets of planning officials recommended taking opposite positions on the protection of the green belt and given this split decision, does she know if Scottish ministers will call it in to allow the independent reporter to look at this? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think the member must be very well aware that this is uh, not a question uh, for this particular portfolio. I can advise him that it is local authorities who are responsible for both the designation and the protection of green belts uh, to help direct developments uh, to the right locations. And they do that as part of a local development plan process. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for me uh, or indeed any minister to comment on the merits of any application. I am of course aware uh, of the debate around Aberdeen Football Stadium. Um, it was notified to Scottish ministers on 2nd February uh, and it's currently being assessed and I cannot in all conscience say anything more about it. Question number two, Michelle Ballantyne. 
thank you, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports environmental protection in the Scottish borders. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting and improving Scotland's environment, and this is achieved through the setting of policy frameworks and funding of public bodies such as the Scottish Natural Heritage and the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, uh, and that applies in the Scottish borders as elsewhere in the country. Michelle Valentine. Thank you. Statistics from Scottish Natural Heritage reveal that 23.7% of protected nature sites in the Scottish borders are classified as being in unfavourable condition, with a further 106 recovering from such a state. This includes famous spots such as the Moorfoot Hills and locations along the River Tweed. These figures remain far too high, particularly for a region of such natural beauty. The Scottish Government's national indicator to improve the condition of protected nature sites states that 80.3% of protected nature sites are in a favourable condition, placing the borders below the national average. Can I ask what steps will the Government take to remedy this position? I think uh, uh, both myself and indeed I hope the Member um, would uh, look to Scottish Natural Heritage directly as the body responsible for uh, uh, for uh, uh, con considering the protection of sites. Uh, uh, SNH has a, um, a, a great responsibility for that and in my view they do exceptionally well. If there are very particular issues uh, which the member wants to raise in respect of particular sites in the borders area then I would strongly advise her to raise them uh, either directly through SNH or, or if she wishes to come via me I can do so as well. Emma Harper. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that one of the biggest threats to the environmental protection across Scotland and the UK as a whole is Brexit and the failure of the UK Government to meet the ambition of the Scottish Government and other EU member states? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can hear that it's considerably a, a matter of great boredom to the Conservatives when anybody mentions the word Brexit. It might be of interest to them to know that I will be going to Cardiff on Monday to discuss uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, Brexit-related issues that relate to, directly to my portfolio. So the uh, member, Emma, Emma Harper, is absolutely correct to raise the concerns about the, uh, uh, the impact of Brexit on uh, the environment. Membership of the EU has driven significant progress in environmental protection against Scotland, uh, across Scotland and the UK, as well as funding and collective uh, initiatives which have allowed us to make uh, a very good uh, impact uh, and indeed uh, across a range of issues to do better than the UK uh, as a whole. Um, the withdrawal bill threatens our ability to deliver Scotland's environment and climate ambitions. Devolution has allowed us to be more ambitious uh, and it is my view that we should continue to be so. It's essential that no constraints are placed on Scotland's ability to mirror EU environmental protections and to adopt higher environmental st standards than the UK government. I do not want Scotland to be held back. Question number three, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what importance it gives to the environmental protection of Greenbelt land in the central Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary. I indicated at question one, local authorities are responsible for both designating and protecting greenbelts to help direct development to the right locations, and they do this as part of the local development plan process. Elaine Smith. Well, I thank the Minister for that response. However, the question was deemed to be suitable for the portfolio. So could I ask the Minister if she agrees that since time spent in the natural environment helps reduce levels of anxiety, stress and depression, developing on Greenbelt land at Woodhall and Faskin between Airdrie and Coatbridge, which have some of the most deprived areas in Scotland in those towns, would be contrary to the valuable contribution that Greenbelt Environment Land makes to the mental and physical health of people in built-up ex-industrial areas? And will the Minister support the campaigners who are trying to stop this development and instead have this land designated as a park and nature reserve? Cabinet Secretary. I think the Member will know perfectly well that's an improper question to ask a, a, a Minister to intervene in any way in a planning uh, application. Um, I am absolutely of the view that time outside is incredibly important for people's health and well-being, which is why we do a great deal of work across government in order to achieve that. Uh, and uh, uh, I am uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to make that statement, but what I cannot do uh, is uh, make statements about individual planning applications. Ivan McKee. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that the Scottish Government's support for the Central Scotland Green Network 
is helping to deliver important environmental benefits right across the central belt. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, that would indeed be one of the uh, areas of uh, uh, good investment that uh, uh, delivers on some of the issues that were raised by Elaine Smith in terms of uh, health and well-being. And as the Minister for the Environment, when CSGN first began to be put in place, I do very much agree with that. It not only delivers important environmental outcomes, but also the social and economic benefits that I know that many members in the Chamber would want to see. It focuses on improving green spaces in the most deprived communities in the Central Belt, uh, and it benefits both wildlife and people. Uh, and that's why it's highlighted as a priority in the Programme for Government and National Planning Framework 3, and why we continue to provide financial support to the CSGN Trust. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, so following on from that, um, would, would the Cabinet Secretary uh, agree that the Central Scotland Green Network uh, perhaps should be beefed up, have uh, more powers, should be a statutory consultee uh, when it comes to planning matters. I know planning isn't her brief, but it would give uh, CSGN uh, more of a say. Cabinet Secretary. Well, if the member uh, wishes me to, I will have a conversation with my colleague, uh, the planning minister, uh, about that. I'm not entirely certain whether the way that the CSGN is constituted would uh, allow that to happen. Uh, but he is absolutely right in making the comment that it would not be a matter for me uh, in any case. Question for Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government what actions it's taking to protect mobile marine species. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland has an MPA network to be proud of, covering approximately 20% of our seas and comprising 168 sites. Current actions are progressing protected areas for marine bird species and development of a dolphin and porpoise conservation strategy. In addition, Marine Scotland and Scottish Natural Heritage have begun preparation for public consultation on four marine protected area proposals, three of which are principally for marine mobile species. Ashton. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that by moving ahead, um, WWF believe that we will be creating the world's first protected areas for basking sharks, minke whales and resource dolphins. Can the Cabinet Secretary commit to ensuring that all those with an interest will have the opportunity to input into this consultation on designation and management measures, including marine tourism operators, local communities, fishers and environmental organisations? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wasn't, in fact, aware of the uh, WWF belief, but if it is indeed true, it's great news for Scotland, and members can be absolutely sure I will be making mention of it frequently. Um, of course, the extensive consultation uh, uh, that we undertake in these matters is one of the reasons uh, that these things do take time. Sometimes people become impatient with the time it does take, uh, but all of the work that it goes into the kind of consultation uh, which the member asks about is incredibly important uh, to improve the status of the marine environments underpinned by good scientific evidence and that invaluable stakeholder engagement. So there will be a formal consultation on the four MPAs as well as other opportunities to engage with local interests in regional consultation events. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the serious damage caused to the reef in Loch Carron and the seabird in the Firth of Lawn due to illegal dredging, can the Cabinet Secretary provide assurances that Marine Scotland have the resources they need to effectively safeguard all marine species in marine protected areas? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I think Marine Scotland do an extremely good job in, in this regard. Um, they're involved uh, uh, very closely uh, in the work. Um, and I think that... Uh, uh, the, the work that is done in Scotland is, is not just of national significance, but of global significance as well. Question number five, Claudia Beamish. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether wetland sites in Scotland that are covered by the Ramsar Convention are given the same level of protection as those in the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary. I, I can't actually speak for the rest of the United Kingdom, but as is stated in Scottish planning policy, Protection for Ramsar sites in Scotland is achieved through such sites being either Natura 2000 sites or sites of special scientific interest. And this means that they are protected by the relevant statutory regimes associated with those types of designation, which is entirely compatible with the requirements of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. For a development proposal likely to have a significant effect in a Ramsar site, 
Um, how would the Scottish Government expect the impact of the planning application on such a site to be assessed either by themselves or by the local authority? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, I, I think we've had quite a few references to planning uh, um, uh, process uh, in this question time this afternoon. Um, the local authority is the principal planning authority. Um, will uh, look for uh, uh, advice. The SNH and SEPA will, will be involved in, in any such consultation. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, you know, in those circumstances, uh, all I can say is that, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the planning process works remarkably well uh, in those areas where there may be some major national issues that need to be dealt with. It might be a, a particular planning. Uh, application may end up being called in, but that's not something which I can talk about in terms of generalities because it will depend entirely on the specifics of an individual planning application. Question six, Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the, the, to ask the Scottish Government whether it, will be, whether it will set a target date for phasing out the use of peat-based products in horticulture. Cabinet Secretary. The use of peat in horticulture is a global challenge. The horticulture industry has committed itself to work to support making retail supplies peat free by 2020 and for commercial horticulture to end peat use by 2030. I've asked the SNH led National Peatland Group to consider how it can further support these efforts to end such use. Maurice Corrie. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. The Cabinet Secretary will note that DEFRA's 25-year plan, a commitment was made to ending peat use in horticultural products by 2030. Why hasn't the Cabinet Secretary not committed to this in Scotland, given Scotland's peat peatlands are vi a vital part of carbon sequestration? And when will she come up with a target? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the 25-year environment plan commits to phasing out the use of peat uh, by the following uh, uh, mechanisms by continuing to joint, uh, uh, jointly fund research with the industry to overcome the barriers to peat replacement in commercial horticulture, and this will report in 2020, and by continuing to support the industry as it puts the responsible sourcing scheme for growing media into practice. And the text in that plan was essentially a restatement of the position DEFRA set out in 2013. Uh, now, th there's been a pre-existing task force which... Uh, uh, we were written to about uh, from DEFRA uh, in uh, 2010, I think it was. Um, we were at, they were advising us that they were planning to do so uh, on an England-only uh, basis, and uh, we asked to be involved in that, and we have been uh, involved at that. The, the work was completed, and in response, uh, the uh, above commitments were, uh, were made. But, you know, we have continued to offer support towards the phasing out of PEAT, but we are actually limited in the hard actions that we can take. For example, product standards and taxation are reserved. And if uh, Maurice Corrie is a convert to product standards and taxation being devolved in order for us to be able to take those decisions, then I would welcome him to the cause. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I remind the Chamber that I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, she's kind of answered my question, but I was going to ask if she believes that the Scottish Government has got the sufficient powers to do what Mr Curry is asking. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, as I indicated, to deliver a legislative-based approach to ending the use of peat, we would have to have powers which we currently do not have. I do, however, support the UK Government's commitment towards phasing out the use of peat and I'd be perfectly happy to work with the UK government and others to end this use as quickly as possible if there is an intention to take concrete action. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. Uh, point of order, Elaine Smith. Thank you very much, President Officer. I wondered if you could um, confirm for us that questions that appear on the order paper have actually been deemed admissible for the, the particular portfolio in question. And, and the reason I ask is that originally I was quite keen to ask about tree preservation orders at Faskin and Woodhall, but I was told that trees were rural, which I must say probably comes as a surprise to some of the trees in Cote Bridge, however. Um, <laughs> and therefore, uh, I had to couch my question to the Minister rather differently. But what I did want to ask about was the Minister's um, Depending on environmental protection and also on issues around uh, land being designated as park and nature reserves. So if you could 
just confirm that when questions appear on the order paper, they have been deemed admissible? Indeed, thank the member uh, for point of order. Yes, all questions that have been selected have been deemed admissible. The member will also know that uh, the Chamber Desk and the Government work together as closely as possible to try to make sure that the questions are allocated to the correct brief. Uh, sometimes this is not always possible, but we always try. Answers are, of course, a question, uh, are, are the responsibility of the Minister. I hope that deals with the point of order.